Hidden beneath layers of time, disturbing discoveries confront us with the darkest corners of human history. Strange artifacts whisper of forgotten rituals. Unexplained burials speak of violence that defies understanding. Were these the acts of people driven mad by fear, or something far more sinister? Can we truly grasp the motivations of our ancestors, or do these echoes from the past reveal a darkness within us all? Starting off at number 10, vampire killings. So starting us off, we have the supposed vampire killings from the 1800s. Now, spoiler alert here, they weren't actually vampires. Well, I guess I don't know that for sure, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say they weren't. Anyways, back in the 1800s, people in New England believed that cadavers were rising from their graves at night and preying on the living. So to solve this problem, they began exhuming the cadavers. Now, some kept it simple and just turn the cadaver face down. But others jump to more extreme methods like ripping the bones apart and rearranging them or burning the deceased person's heart and inhaling the smoke. Apparently at the time, it was believed inhaling the smoke cured tuberculosis, though I can only imagine it made matters much worse for them. Some towns were so into the ritual that they would even hold festivals during the process and celebrate the exhumation and subsequent destruction of the corpse corpses all together. So while it was incredibly unsettling, they did truly believe they were vampires haunting them in the night, so I guess it gave them some peace of mind. Next up at number 9, dentures. While today dentures are made from composite resin or sometimes porcelain, during the 18th and 19th centuries, of course, those materials weren't available. But as you can imagine, people were still losing teeth at an even higher rate due to the high sugar diet, attempted teeth whitening, which was really just just wearing away their enamel instead of brightening it, and the overall lack of knowledge around hygiene. So dentures were still needed and wanted by many. So what was their material of choice? Well, for the easiest and most profitable route, many would acquire the teeth from dead bodies. Although if you had some money, you might be able to afford dentures made from ivory. Other materials were sometimes the teeth of animals or wood, but honestly, I think we can all agree that none of those sound like terribly sanitary options options, considering professional physicians at the time weren't sterilizing instruments and some didn't even believe in disinfecting prior to surgery. Next up at number 8, stained glass. If you walk into just about any old church, you'll notice the walls are decorated with beautiful stained glass. But what might surprise you is that in some of the particularly older pieces, there is a strange ingredient that helps it all come together. In 1112, a German monk wrote about the process of creating the beautifully colored glass, and as he detailed, it starts off innocently enough, adding sand and potash at a high temp until it becomes molten. From there, they'd add a stabilizer before coloring the glass with different metallic oxides like copper, cobalt, and gold. But once the glass was cooled and shaped, the small details were added by paint. They made the paint usually from lead or copper and would then suspend it in urine. So quite literally, some of those old stained glass windows were painted with pea paint, which I mean kind of just makes me giggle if I'm honest, but it is definitely a weird ingredient to think about being in paint. Coming in at number 7, leather bound books. Nowadays it's unusual to even find real leather on anything, but once upon a time the leather on books wasn't even from cows, it was from people. Called anthropodermic bibliopegy, the books were made in a similar way as they would now, but obviously with one huge difference. They used human skin instead of an animal. While there are actually only 18 confirmed books of its kind that still exist, we have no idea just how many there could have been all those years ago. Allegedly the books were usually made from executed convicts, and during the French Revolution there were rumors that a tannery for human human skin was established outside of Paris. I mean, it kind of gives me the willies to think about it, and I'm just glad we've moved on to a different material to bind our books today. Next up at number 6, Minnie Dean. Wilhelmina Dean, or Minnie as she was often referred to, was a nanny in New Zealand during 1880 and was a well-known caretaker in her town. But something was off with the woman, and soon she began having quite the dark spot on her name and career. In 1889, one of the 
young people under her care suddenly died, as if out of nowhere, and initially it was viewed as a freak accident. But two years later, the same thing happened again. Now, with two minors perished under her care, police decided to investigate further into the matter. After a bit of sleuthing, it was concluded that under Minnie's care, the two minors were as she was attempting to take out life insurance on them. Police immediately took the remaining young boy in her care, finding it in dirty clothes and drinking curdled milk. By 1895, the investigation into her crimes continued, and she was spotted trying to flee on a train with another victim in her arms. And when police searched her house, they found three more covered up victims. Eventually found guilty for all her crimes, she was the first and only woman ever hanged in New Zealand. Next up at number 5. Radiation test subject. In 1999, a man named Hisachi Uchi was a power plant technician and he became known for being exposed to the highest amount of radiation of any human in history. While working at the Tokamura nuclear power plant, after a lack of safety protocols, improper training, and just an overall pressure to meet deadlines, Uchi and his co workers made a terrible error. They mistakenly mixed an incorrect measurement of radioactive materials into the wrong tank. And as you've probably figured out, it caused a near fatal burst of gamma rays. Hisashi, who happened to be the closest to the incident, was brutally injured and sent to the hospital. Once he was there, it was discovered he had no more white blood cells, so essentially meaning that he had no remaining immune system. And despite being in intense pain with a rapidly deteriorating condition, doctors kept him alive under the family's request. So for eight 83 days Uchi remained alive, being used as a test subject for experimental radiation treatment by the doctors, which I mean in their defense was the request of the family, but still he endured several cardiac arrests, lost all of his skin, and suffered brain damage as well as organ failure. One of the last things Uchi ever said was, quote, I can't take it anymore, I'm not a guinea pig. And then finally, one more cardiac arrest released him from his torture. Coming in at number 4, Mamiya. Most widely practiced between the 12th to the 17th century, although there were a few cases in the 18th century that pop up, Mamiya was widely used as a means of medicine in many European countries. Now if you can't tell by the name, Mamiya is creepily just as it sounds, the use of human remains to fix a living person's ailments. It was believed by many of the top physicians at the time that ingesting certain remains prompted the medicinal power of the mummy and could cure things like coagulated blood, pain, coughs, inflammation, cramps, and even heal open wounds. Now, they didn't just sit around eating the carcass directly, instead they would either grind the bones into a powder and drink it from there, or drink an extracted liquid from the embalmed individual. In fact, it was so popular at one point that it's believed the reason there are so few mummies these days is because of the high demand of flesh at the time. Coming in at number 3, James Jameson. One of the heirs to the Jameson whiskey family fortune, Jameson considered himself to be an adventurer of sorts and often traveled to far off lands detailing the trips in his diary. In 1888, Jameson decided to head out to explore the Congo, and while there he wrote about and demanded some gruesome things from the locals. So before beginning this expedition, Jameson discovered that the area he was visiting was known to have a population that participated in the eating of other humans. Apparently Jameson set out to witness it firsthand, which I mean, why was that his dream? A little suspicious if you ask me, but I digress. <laughs> According to Asad Faran, who was his translator for the trip, Jameson bought a girl from a trader of slaves for a few handkerchiefs and gave her over to the tribe to be Allegedly, he didn't pay the tribe directly, but in a roundabout way, he did sort of pay to have this girl c What's even more gross is that he proceeded to draw and paint watercolors of the gruesome event while it happened. Which again, just wrong on so many levels. Coming in at number 2. 
Cambodian Barbies. You may have been taught about the Khmer Rouge in history class, but if they don't ring a bell, essentially they were an extreme communist regime in Cambodia that held government between 1975 to 1979. They were known for being extremely cruel and committed some of the most horrifying acts of genocide in history, with nearly 2 million perishing under their ruling. Now, during their radical rule, the entire country was isolated from all foreign influences. This included closing schools, hospitals, factories, banks, foreign agriculture. They believed this would stimulate the rebirth of the country, but of course, all it did was send it into desolate famine and poverty. Led by a man named Pol Pot, the people of the country could not forage for food, despite the fact that everyone was starving, and anyone who disobeyed the orders was killed. Apparently, as the people became more and more desperate, they began to turn to folk magic, turning Barbie dolls into smoking talismans for luck. Thankfully, since its dissolution in 1999, all the leaders have been jailed for their atrocities, and the people are freed from the genocidal regime. And last up in our number one spot, the Rabbit Woman. Her name was Mary Toft, and in 1726, she became known throughout Surrey, England, as having been the woman who gave birth to rabbits. Now, I know what you're thinking, that isn't possible. And you would be right. But still, the story of how she convinced people it was real was crazy. Apparently, Toft was actually pregnant at one point, but miscarried, and it could have been this that sent her into her madness. Toft began declaring that she was giving birth to various animal parts, and so her local doctor became involved in the case. At first, everyone actually believed her, as in fact, a rabbit did, well, come out of her. And with a doctor backing up her claims, the king and his royal surgeon got involved. Unlike her local doctor, the king surgeon was skeptical, and after discovering corn inside the stomach of one of the rabbits and hay in their droppings, it proved the animal hadn't developed inside Mary. Eventually, Mary Toft admitted to the hoax and explained that she had manually inserted the animals inside her to make the delivery as realistic as possible. She was immediately imprisoned for fraud, and the medical community was ridiculed for having been fooled. All right, so this first one is completely nuts. At one point, the CIA came up with a plan to take out Fidel Castro with an exploding seashell. I, I am not making this up for clicks. I know it sounds like Saturday morning, like cartoon lunacy, but this really did happen. The US government attempted to take this guy's life apparently hundreds of times, and he just kept managing to dodge the attempts. They started getting pretty creative. I mean, they had to at some point. Exploding cigars, a poisoned diving suit, poison and face cream, the list goes on, but the exploding seashell has to be one of the strangest, and I, I wanna say ill thought out. Like, listen to this plan and tell me it's not a bit of a stretch. So Castro was an avid diver, so the CIA rigged this brightly colored conch shell with an explosive and placed it in one of his favorite diving spots. So the hope was that he'd go to this particular diving spot, find the shell, decide to pick it up, not to mention someone else could have dove into that spot first and found the shell. So yeah, this plan was scrapped for very good reason. Speaking of completely nuts, up next we have a pretty nasty experiment that took place between 1913 and 1951 and involved testicular transplants. During that time, eugenicist Leo Stanley was the chief surgeon at San Quentin State Prison, aka Cali's oldest correctional facility. The guy was a freak. He started off his career by performing vasectomies on inmates, but soon turned his interests elsewhere. He became fascinated by the effects of aging, believing that decreased hormones contributed to criminality, weak morality, and poor physical attributes. His solution? Yep, trading testes. Stanley began using the testicles of executed male prisoners and transplanting them into older men in an attempt to restore their masculinity. Guess what? It gets worse. Apparently so many people signed up for this treatment that Stanley ran into an issue. He had a supply shortage. His solution? Animals. Oh, but wait, there's more. Eventually, Stanley got lazy, and so instead of performing a proper transplant, he instead ground up the animal's parts into a paste, and then he injected that paste into the men's abdomens. Procedure count? 10,000. Wacko nut job? Yes. All right, next up. 
spy cats. Yeah, that's right. The CIA also tried to train cats as spies during the Cold War. There needs to be a cartoon about this, I think. At the beginning, it could actually say, like, based on true events. Anyway, it does sound like a Ninja Turtles ripoff, but this actually was a thing. Project Acoustic Kitty was a CIA project that set out to use cats to spy on the Kremlin and Soviet embassies in the 60s. They had a vet implant a microphone in a cat's ear canal along with a tiny radio transmitter at the base of its skull so that the cat was set up to record and transmit audio. Its first mission, eavesdrop on two men at a park outside the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C. The mission was not a success. As soon as the cat was released, it was run over by a taxi. Further attempts were made... Oh, God. I don't... <laughs> That's, that is, I'm sorry, that's, that's funny. <laughs> Further attempts were made with other cats, but the problem was they were too distracted to be of any use and nothing productive came of this $20 million project. Yeah, I mean, cats, why cats? Like, they're just, they, they do their own thing, man. They're, they're hard, you can't train them. Acoustic Kitty uh, came to a halt in 1967. The whole thing was a complete secret until 2001 when the CIA documents were declassified. Okay, next up we have another pretty shitey dude who also worked at a prison. Oncologist Chester Southam working at Salon Kettering Institute during the 1950s and 60s. What made this guy so bad? Well, he has been known to inject patients with live cancer cells without their permission and against their will. He originally implanted the cells into people who had already received terminal cancer diagnosis, but of course he later went on to inject the cells into healthy subjects instead. His goal in all of this was to see how the immune system reacted to the cells. The answer, not well, albeit the healthy people had better results than those who suffered from already terminal illnesses. Eventually, the doctor went back to treating sick individuals, this time at the Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital in Brooklyn, New York. But it was here that his experimentation was met with resistance, obviously, and it was revealed to the public. The result, a big, fat lawsuit, and his medical license being suspended for one year, which was later reduced to a probation. He continued to study and practice medicine. That's insane. What the heck? Next up, we have nukes on the moon with Project A-11-9. So this was a secret plan developed by the United States Air Force in 1958 during the Cold War. A lot of weird stuff going on in the Cold War. The idea behind this was to detonate a nuclear on the moon. Now, you're probably wondering why anyone would want to do something like this. There were a couple reasons. The main goal here really was to demonstrate the military and technological might of the United States to the Soviet Union, who at the time were making big strides in the space race. It was basically just incredibly petty, but scientists were also curious about what would happen if a nuclear bomb exploded on the moon, I guess. They wanted to study things like the impact it would have on the surface and whether it would create any detectable effects from Earth, but the project never actually happened. It was eventually scrapped because of concerns about the potential negative consequences. People were worried about the environmental impact of detonating a nuclear space, as well as the potential political fallout. On top of all that, though, uh, this just would have been a total waste of time. Next up, we have the Miley killings, which took place on March 6th of 1968. On that day, the American military killed around 576 South Vietnamese civilians, including some of the most vulnerable members of the community, who had absolutely nothing to do with the ongoing conflict at the time. When the public learned about the atrocity, which was broadcasted in 1969 on major news networks who shared graphic images of the incident, they were not happy. The event became a major controversy, with many demanding the perpetrators responsible for ending so many innocent lives be held accountable for their actions. Platoon Commander Lieutenant William Calley Jr. was given a life sentence 
but it didn't stick. At the order of President Nixon, Callie was instead placed on house arrest and then released just three and a half years later. 26 soldiers were charged in military court, but none were convicted. The war continued until 1975 and resulted in an estimated total of 1.4 million civilian casualties in southern Vietnam. This next one sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it isn't. Operation Northwoods. So this was a plan devised by the US Department of Defense in 1962. The basic idea was to carry out a series of deceptive and covert operations to create a justification for the United States to invade Cuba. Cuba was seen as a potential threat at the time because it had close ties with the Soviet Union. The US government was worried about communism spreading in the West and Cuba was seen as a potential domino that could fall. So Operation Northwoods proposed things like staging attacks on US soil and then blaming it on Cuba, hijacking planes and ships, even orchestrating violent incidents in American cities. Like The goal was to create public outrage and support for military action against Cuba. Crazy. Luckily, this was proposed, but it was rejected by the Kennedy administration. The fact that it was even brought up though, as a possibility is incredibly disturbing. Next up we have the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. The incident took place on January 28th of that year. A union oil rig suffered a major blowout that caused three million barrels of oil to spill into 35 miles of the coastline of Santa Barbara, California. The impact of the environment was catastrophic. An estimated 3,500 seabirds were immediately smothered in oil, as well as countless other marine animals. It screwed the ecosystem, the environment, and the economy. And people were pissed, rightfully so. The only good thing about the incident was that it led to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, which is an independent agency of the United States government tasked with environmental protection matters and efforts. But surprise, surprise, attempts to undermine the agency have been successful, and that is why we have offshore oil drilling, one of the largest contributors to oceanic environmental issues to date, other than pollution, litter, you guys know what I mean. Operation Mockingbird was a covert operation carried out by the CIA during the Cold War. The goal of this operation was to influence and manipulate media outlets, both domestically and internationally, trying to spin things to promote certain narratives and agendas. Operation Mockingbird was involved in stuff like planting stories, manipulating news content, even recruiting journalists to act as CIA assets. The idea was to ensure that the info reaching the public aligned with the government's objective and promoting anti-communist sentiment. Now, a lot of what Operation Mockingbird did is still kind of murky, but details have come to light over time through declassified documents and investigative journalism. Now, apparently, even some journalists at the time were spied on having their phones tapped and stuff as well. And to finish us off, we have the highly unethical detonation of the world's first atomic explosive, Trinity, which was an exact replica of Fat Man, the explosive device that devastated Nagasaki on August 9th of 1945. And Trinity was detonated just 15 miles away from commercial farms as well as residential homes. Oh, and they didn't warn anyone or evacuate anyone in that surrounding area. So in New Mexico, on July 16th of 1945, less than just one month prior to the events in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they went ahead and detonated the highly unstable and incredibly under-researched explosive, exposing those living nearby to over 10,000 times the recommended levels of radiation. And some of the radiation even reached all the way to Indiana, which is like five states over, which is crazy, which is why this incident ended up on this list. Starting off this countdown, we have Slayer. Slayer was an American metal band formed in 1982, California. Just by listening to the title of the songs, you'll get an idea just how dark the band is. From a song titled Mandatory to one titled Antichrist or Postmortem, 
you kind of get the vibe of what the band was going for. Now, what made them so dark is the fact that some of their songs were written based on real life acts of brutality. They wrote about serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer and also talked about prison camp torture and 9-11. So yeah, they're singing about some pretty dark stuff. One of their songs, Dead Skin Mask, was a tribute to the Wisconsin serial killer, Ed Gein. He would take the skin and body parts off of women and then use them to make chair covers or a bodysuit. You get the idea. This song was written in a POV form as the serial killer. Doesn't get much creepier than that. Oh wait, it does. Just listen to some of their other songs. In our number nine spot today, we have Mayhem. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit that thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far, because it really helps us out. Mayhem is a black metal band from Norway. They got their start in 1984 and began to make some pretty dark music, as well as participating in some questionable dark behavior. In 1991, the lead singer of the band took his own life, and the guitarist of the band took photos of his body, and then the band used these photos as the cover of one of their live albums. Well, it's not really my place to tell anyone how to deal with the loss of their friend, this just doesn't exactly sit well with me. This kind of behavior was certainly reflected in their music. The guitar in their music has been described as sounding like it is electrocuting someone, and the vocals of their music have been described as sounding dead. In our eighth spot, we have Hannah Tarash. Hannah Tarash, whose name means sniveler or snot nose in Japanese, is referred to as Japan's most dangerous band. And you'll learn why in just a second. So the band was started back in 1984 when two of the members met at the same job. From there, they strive to put on thrilling shows. Now, their music is quite different. They put out noise music, which is basically just a bunch of noises formed together, rather than like a typical song with lyrics or a melody. But what they were really known for were their live performances. During one performance, they cut a dead cat in half with a machete. If that's not hardcore, then I don't know what is. At one of the show, it said that one of the band members threw sheets of glass into the audience. Yeah, audience members had to sign waivers before the concert so that they couldn't sue them if they got hurt. During another performance, one of the guys almost chopped off his leg with a chainsaw. It was by accident, but still. Oh, and you can't forget about the time that they drove a bulldozer through the venue. Yeah, as a result, they were banned from performing at most venues. What a surprise. Seriously, these guys took entertainment to the extreme. Moving on to number seven, we have Dark Throne. This band is another Norwegian black metal band who saw their start in the 80s. They were originally a death metal band called Black Death, but made their switch to black metal in 1991 and have been leading the scene ever since. The band mostly consists of duo Nocturno Culto and Frenriz after their guitarist and third member of the band left in 1993. In 2006, the band began to branch out on their music style a bit and began to incorporate more heavy metal and speed metal influences into their sound. In our sixth spot, we have Goat Lord. Goat Lord was an American extreme metal band from Las Vegas, Nevada. This band had a very cult-like following and they had some interesting and pretty dark songs. Some include Possessed Soldiers of War, Keep On the F***ing Hell, and Blood Monk. Other titles of their songs would just be censored out completely if I even said them, so. Now, one of the reasons why this band got such a bad rap was because of their founding guitarist, Joe Franklin. In 2015, he shot and killed his neighbor, then went on to kidnap his son. Sadly, he took his son's life before taking his own. In our number five spot today, we have Gnaw Their Tongues. I'm not sure if I really have to explain this one because their name really does say it all. This experimental musical project was started by Dutch composer Maurice de Jong in 2004, and in 2006, they released their debut album called Spit At Me and Wreak Havoc on My Flesh. You know what they say, first impressions count, and boy did they take that to heart. A lot of the music that Maurice makes deals with the most horrifying and sick parts of the human condition, so it's no wonder the band has a coveted spot on this list. The name of the band comes from an apocalyptic bible verse that really sets the stage for the type of music that they would be putting out. In a happy turn of events, Maurice has been described as a remarkably pleasant person with a gentle demeanor. I kind of love how his music is the antithesis of who he is as a person, but I guess that really just speaks to his artistry. And at number four we have Watang. I'm sorry if I pronounced that name wrong, I don't listen to this band, clearly. 
Watain is a Swedish black metal band that formed in 1998 and is another band known for its very dark, over the top shows. In 2014, during a show in Brooklyn, they drenched the audience in real animal blood. Yeah, you know, like Carrie style. This caused a lot of the audience members to vomit. They weren't only known for that. They would often drench themselves in pig blood during their shows. To top it all off, the stage was often filled with rotting animal meat. So yeah, not the type of concert that entices me. In our number three spot today, we have Abruptum. This Swedish black metal band got their start in 1989 and it consists of the members called It, who is the creator, Evil, Ext, and All. Evil is the only member who is still in the band and runs the whole thing by himself. Remember the guy from Mayhem who took those creepy pictures of his friend's body? That guy described Abruptum as the audio essence of pure black evil. If that guy says that about your music, I am honestly too scared to even listen. Although it created the band in 87, it wasn't until 1990 that the other members joined and they began releasing music. The band actually ended in 2005, but in 2008, Evil ended up bringing it back to life. While the band is classified as black metal, a lot of people say that the songs aren't really structured at all and are mostly just made of noise. It is said that the screaming that can be heard in their music comes from the band members hurting each other in order to get the sound. This has not been confirmed, but is a pretty terrifying rumor. In our number two spot today, we have Belfagor. Belfagor is an Austrian extreme metal band that originated in 1991. They were originally named Betrayer, but they changed their name in 1993 to be named after a demon. Their music has been described as being diabolical death metal, which is quite an honest depiction of their music. In 1995, the band redesigned their logo and had it depict two inverted crosses surrounded by blood. The demon that the band is named after is one of the seven princes of hell and is the chief demon of the deadly sin, Sloth. He is said to seduce and tempt people by means of laziness. The band's 10th album called Conjuring the Death has been their most successful release to date. In April of 2016, before a show in St. Petersburg, the band's leader, called the Helmuth Leonard, was attacked by an orthodox activist at the Pulkovo airport, so their dark music is obviously upsetting people who don't quite agree with the lifestyle. Their latest this album was released in 2017, but the band still remains active today. And in our number one spot, we have Gigi Allen. If you have heard about this guy, then you know all the controversial stuff that he has done. He literally has been called the most violent man in rock and roll. And I'm about to tell you why. So it all started during one performance when he took laxatives prior and literally pooped himself on stage. Then there was a full on riot because it smelled so bad and people were trying to get away from him. But it doesn't stop there. No, this whole pooping himself became his trademark. He would then deliberately take laxatives, poop himself on stage, then, I'm sorry, this is gonna get really gross, but he would take his feces and throw it into the crowd or smear it all over his body and face. Sometimes he would even consume it. I know, it's disgusting, but that's not all. He would also sometimes get really violent and beat up his audience or harm himself on stage for them all to see. There's even rumors that he would take advantage of both men and women on stage. Lastly, Alan was famous for telling his audience that he was going to take his own life on stage. Every show, he would say he was going to do it. He never did. On June 28, 1993, Alan passed away from an accidental drug overdose. Kicking off our list at number 10, the reindeer gift. We'll turn the clocks back to 1941, right off the hop. When the Germans were attacking the Soviet Union, it was of course one of the biggest attacks in history. Britain and the United States had to send over weapons, supplies, anything really, just to keep them afloat, just to keep them in the fight. Now they sent these supplies through the Arctic Circle, that was the only route, but of course it was littered with U-boats, you know, war stuff. So thankfully the British HMS Trident was there to watch the waters, and in turn the Soviets were able to fight on. As a gift, as a thank you rather, the Soviets sent the captain of the Trident, they sent him a live reindeer. That the British, of course, had to accept because it was ill-mannered if you don't. So they had to keep a six foot tall, real life living reindeer on a submarine. Must be comfortable, awesome. Imagine the smell. Her name was Pollyanna and they brought her on board through a torpedo tube. She was tiny, she's the cutest little thing. She was a crew member for six weeks, which is honestly hilarious because you know some of those guys got way too attached. You know for sure. She slept better than most, if I'm being 
being honest, she shared her room in the captain's quarters. Again, imagine the smell. I don't know, is it worth it? I've always wanted a baby goat growing up, so this is kind of the closest thing. I'm jealous, I'm weirdly jealous. Number nine, Stalin Photoshop. Deep fakes are getting out of hand. I have no idea what's real or what's fake anymore. To be honest, I'm not even Taylor. I'm actually Olivia doing a list right now, but it's been deep faked so well that you believe it. Modern technology is really making it hard to tell what's real and what's not, but it goes back. Back in 1939, a photo of Stalin was published and he looks normal. He actually looks kind of great. Some would say he looks way too good. You know what I mean? He was touching up photos as far back as 1939, just airbrushing, just digitally removing all those zits and stuff. Like really, that far back? But even if you got a photo with Stalin, there's a chance that you yourself would be digitally removed. Like Nikolai Yitzhov, for example, the leader of the NKVD. He was in a photo with Stalin, but around 1937, Nikolai was responsible for orders that had over 1 million people arrested. So it wasn't ideal to be in a photo with Nikolai at the time. So he was denounced, imprisoned, and he died in 1940. So Stalin had him digitally erased and replaced in a photo. That's pretty hilarious. I don't know, this man was ahead of his time via Photoshop. How did he do it? How did they do it? No one knows. Number eight, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. Nice, I remember this one. I heard about this on LimeWire. That was cool. Heard about that at full volume. This was a huge presidential scandal. Back when you, you know, didn't happen every other week and stuff, this was a big deal. It was 1998 and Clinton's White House intern Monica Lewinsky was 22 years old at the time. Yeah, young. When you think back to all this old history, you're like, oh, they were this. No, very young, extremely young. They had a situation from 1995 to 1997, despite what LimeWire told us. Lewinsky said she hooked up with Bill nine different times at the White House, and apparently, according to her schedule, Hillary Clinton was at the White House for at least seven of those times. She's like, what's going on in there, huh? Is that my... Who is that? Number seven, adhesive bras. We'll liven this up a little bit with some vintage history that's it's kind of funny. It's pretty funny. Let's talk about sticky bras, shall we? What a mess this was, oh my. Back in 1949, Life Magazine released an article that caught everybody's attention, obviously. This was news, this was like a new technology that was being announced. It was May 16th, 1949, and the article read, for 5,000 years, clothes have been draped, tied, buttoned, pinned, and buckled on the human form. This year, for the first time in history, drum roll, they will be glued on. What in the world? How? This is witchcraft. How did that happen? Just one, two, that's it? That's easy. Inventor Charles Langs changed the game, or he thought he did, in 1949. He made these bra cups that would stick to you with adhesive. This, you know, special glue. This special glue. This specific adhesive was promised to leave behind no residue, it was supposed to be painless, yet at the same time, stay glued on even if you were to jump into a pool from a 10 foot diving board. That was the sell. Yeah, well that's not true, that's definitely not true. Well Langs ended up selling the company to Textron later on and the product ultimately failed. Number six, nuclear sight list. All right, back to the, you know, back to the dark stuff. Here on Most Amazing, we love lists, right? I'm not sure if you can tell. Smash that thumbs up, hit subscribe, yada yada, we love it. But apparently the US government also fancies a list or two. Who thought? Back when Obama was still running the show, a report was delivered to Congress, or rather it was supposed to be. The 266 page report featuring, you know, every nook and cranny about the US nuclear program. It was released publicly on the government printing office's website in draft form. Draft form, couldn't have been easier. Just a casual PDF that shows us maps with stockpiled fuel used for nuclear warheads. Awesome, right next to your resume. Imagine that, so convenient. How does this even happen? I thought this type of stuff could never happen, right? Well, MIT professor John M. Dutch said that these screw ups do of course happen and it's normal and this one here isn't a serious breach. I mean, it certainly sounds serious, but okay. We'll just have to trust the government. Number five, UFOs in the ocean. This video here was leaked in the last couple of years. You've probably seen it, hopefully not. This would be a great day. The footage itself was recorded in 2019 in San Diego. Now the Pentagon has since of course confirmed its authenticity and the UAP, the unidentified aerial phenomenon here, is sphere shaped and it's flying at extremely high speeds. There's no exhaust, no propulsion system whatsoever. It's just a metal ball whipping by San Diego and now, we're questioning our beliefs, so that's fun. The sphere vanished into the water afterwards, into the ocean, and then was never seen ever again. Number four, radar footage. Now normally when we see leaked footage, be it of UAPs or leaked documents, whatever, it's always the worst quality. Like that one, 
not the best, right? Not quite 4K. It's hard to believe when military footage is poor quality, right? Like how can we see photos of black holes and not even have a photo of a UAP yet, right? What's going on here? Well, Jeremy Corbell, he's here to help. Jeremy? What if he just walked in? That would be crazy. He's not here. That's insane. Jeremy took to Twitter in May 2021 sharing footage of US Navy ships being swarmed by UFOs. Like more than one. Sorry, UAPs. We're not going to call them that anymore. Now this time we have radar footage and that's pretty sweet. That's different. It came from the Combat Information Center aboard the USS Omaha. The 46 second clip was originally recorded July 15th, 2019. You can even hear people in the background reacting to what's happening in real time. You hear panic in their voices. These military personnel in the background, you can overhear them talking about how fast the objects are moving on the radar. So, seems very believable this time, right? It's not just a grainy footage, it's like a live reaction kind of. And if he's spooked, we're spooked, right? Number three, Watergate. I have to include Watergate, right? It's one of the biggest scandals in US history. Right in the middle of 1972, there were five men who were all arrested for breaking into the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, DC. It was clear that they intended on bugging the place, right? It was fishy, it was obvious, they looked like and spy kids, right? They were up to no good. Now, as the year went on, the election came closer and closer, and all of a sudden, out of the woodwork comes this anonymous source who fed information to Washington Post that the Watergate bugging incident was a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage kicked off by none other than President Nixon himself. It was kicked off by his re-election and directed by officials of the White House. It was a whole planned thing. Now, despite this information leak and it being reported to the news, Nixon was still re-elected. Now these men were clearly linked to a fundraising group for Nixon, but his administration just kept denying any involvement, right? That's the key. Deny, deny, deny. It wasn't until later that year in 1972 when reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, they came forward and exposed everything. Now we got the truth. They exposed the administrator's role in the entire scandal, how they had an inside source, an FBI agent named Mark Felt. It was a whole thing. This ultimately led to Nixon resigning in 1974, the first ever president to do so. Yeah, that's how you know you got caught when you have to resign. Know what I mean? Number two, shadow brokers. Back in August 2016, a group named the Shadow Brokers were the talk of the town. And with that name, how can you not be, right? The Shadow Brokers would steal cyber weapons from an NSA hacking unit and then proceed to sell them online to the highest bidder. Now this sounds made up, this sounds like it's from a movie, this is crazy, right? Now these tools, these tools in question, these cyber weapons, they've been used by many countries and many not so great sounding schemes. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, you name it, these cyber attacks can happen anywhere, right? The 2019 ransomware cyber attack, that's one example. This incident was connected to the Shadow Brokers. So whoever this mysterious group is, it still remains a mystery and still sounds made up as shit. Sounds like a DC Comics villain. It's insane. And finally, number one, motorized roller skates. We'll end on a fun one because, you know, why not? This last one they've been working on for a very long time and we still can't crack it, right? This is the craziest thing I've ever seen working on this channel, so I gotta end with it. Motorized roller skates. What a nightmare this would be. Imagine if this worked out. Even Elon Musk would see this and be like, no, that's crazy. This photo was taken at the Sunoco station in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, context aside, this is an odd one. A guy with a briefcase is filling up at the gas station and he's wearing roller skates. That would look bad today. You would have SWAT teams rolling up if you saw that, right? It's 1956 and that futuristic looking man right there is Mike Dreschler. Now, at the time, he was working for a Detroit skate company, but he was very close to gas-powered skates. They would have cost around $250, which today is around $2,400. And its max speed was 17 miles an hour. Again, imagine that in the closing act of like a Mission Impossible movie. That's crazy. Now obviously the public wasn't supposed to see this. They feared that it would encourage folks to get creative on their own and you know, launch their way to work. So yeah, don't make rocket skates with gasoline. Thanks. Starting off this countdown, we have Jean-Marie Duberry. On February 13th, 1746, a French man named Jean-Marie was executed for the murder of his father. Hundreds of years later, on the exact same day, a man named Jean-Marie Duberry was also sentenced to death. He had also taken the life of his father. So what are the odds that two unrelated people with the same name both killed their fathers and then got executed on the same day? Like that is just way too freaky. In our ninth spot, we have the dollar bill. Now this is a pretty wholesome one for you all. When a woman named Esther was young, she had written her name on a couple of dollar bills after a bad breakup. 
She then told herself that she was going to marry the man that brought the bill back to her. Well, years later, she was dating a man named Paul Gratchen. The day he asked Esther to be his girlfriend, they were at a sandwich shop. As he was paying for the meal, he got handed a dollar bill with the name Esther written on it. The bill she wrote years prior. And in the end, they ended up getting married. Now, how wholesome is that? The universe literally gave her what she had manifested. Coming in at number eight, we have the girls with the red balloon. In 2001, a 10 year old girl named Laura Buxton decided to release a red balloon from her front yard with a message on it. The balloon said, please return to Laura Buxton and it had her address written on it. Well, this balloon traveled 140 miles and ended up landing on the yard of another 10 year old girl's house. This girl's name was also Laura Buxton. Like what are the odds? The two Laura Buxtons ended up meeting and they discovered that they had tons of similarities, not just their age and name. For example, they both had a guinea pig, a gray rabbit, and a three-year-old chocolate lab. They both also looked alike and dressed alike. I'm telling you, this is just way too freaky. Like, what are the odds? I'm gonna be saying that a lot in this video. What are the odds? Moving on to number seven, we have Mark Twain and Haley's Comet. Every 76 years, Haley's Comet is visible to the naked eye as it soars past Earth. Well, American writer Mark Twain was born on one of Haley's Comet's passing in 1835. The next year that the comet was said to pass was in 1910, and Mark Twain predicted that he was going to die that year. He said that he came into the world with the comet and that he was going to leave the world with the comet as well. And Mark Twain was right. Mark Twain passed one day after the comet's closest approach in 1910. So not only did Mark Twain predict his own death, but his birth and death both seamlessly lined up with Halley's comet. How freaky. In our sixth spot, we have Violet Jessup. Violet Jessup has been named the luckiest woman as well as the unluckiest woman. She also has been given the name Miss Unsinkable, and I'll explain how she got those nicknames in just a second. So Violet was a stewardess and nurse who was on board three big sister ships when disaster struck each of them. It started with the HMS Olympic. She was on board the ship when it collided with the HMS Hawk. Then she was on the HMHS Britannic when it struck a mine at sea. And lastly, she was on board the Titanic and she managed to escape all three of these disasters. At this point, she probably was cursed. And after the first accident, she shouldn't have gotten back on any ships ever again. So that's why she's been given the name, the luckiest, unluckiest woman to live. She's been lucky to survive all the accidents, but unlucky that they kept happening to her. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Danielle Dutoit. The irony behind this next story is mind blowing. So Danielle Dutoit was a South African astronomer. Over his life, he discovered and co-discovered several comets. He also spent his days giving lectures. On September 28th, 1981, he gave a lecture on how death can strike anyone at any time. As soon as the lecture was done, he popped a mint into his mouth. The mint then slid to the back of his throat. He choked on it and died right then and there. So yeah, I'd say his lecture was pretty spot on. In our fourth spot today, we have Harry Zigland. Now this story is kind of controversial. Some say it's an old wives tale. Others say that it actually did happen. Now if it did happen, then this is the definition of karma. So back in the day, there was a man named Harry Zigland who broke a woman's heart. She was so heartbroken that she took her own life. Her brother was so devastated and angry at Harry that he vowed to get revenge on him. So he went out to find Harry with his gun and shot at him. Harry fell to the floor and the brother, thinking that he had succeeded in killing him, grabbed his gun and took his own life. But Harry survived. The bullet didn't strike him. Instead, it hit and got lodged into a nearby tree. Three years later, Henry was using dynamite to remove the tree. When he blew it up, the explosion sent the bullet out of the tree and it hit and instantly killed him. It took Karma three years, but it finally caught up to him. Coming in at number three, we have the Hoover Dam. Over the course of the construction of the Hoover Dam, there were 96 deaths. The first death was of a man named J.G. or George Turney. It occurred on December 20th, 1922. He sadly lost his life after drowning in the dam. 14 years later, on the exact anniversary of this guy's death, his son, Patrick Turney, 
lost his life. He fell from an electrical tower and died. This was also the final death reported during the construction of the dam, meaning the first man to die and the last man were father and son, and it happened on the exact same day. Coming in at number two, we have Jack Frost and other stories. Some things are just meant to be, and you'll believe this once you hear this next story. Children's book author Anne Parrish was with her husband in Paris when they stopped by an antique bookshop from the 1920s. While in there, she found a copy of Jack Frost and other stories. She told her husband that that was her favorite book as a child. Well, when he opened the book, it had her name written inside of it. It read Anne Parrish, 209N Weber Street, Colorado Springs. So not only did it have Anne's name in the book, but it had the place she grew up in, Colorado Springs. Seems like Anne was meant to find that book. And in our number one spot today, we have the two presidents. Turns out that Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy share a lot of eerie coincidences. Besides the fact that they both were American presidents, they both were killed by a gunshot wound to the back of the head. They both passed away on a Friday. They both died before a celebration. Kennedy was assassinated on the eve of Thanksgiving. Lincoln died right before Easter. And each were accompanied by their wife and another couple when they were killed. But that's not all. They both had best friends named Billy Graham. Both Billies had four children, and they both had secretaries named after the other president. Kennedy's secretary was Miss Lincoln. Lincoln's secretary was John. But wait, there's even more. Both of their successors were vice presidents called Johnson. The freakiest coincidence, Lincoln was shot in Ford's theater. Kennedy was shot in a Lincoln made by Ford. Whoa, boom, mic drop. Isn't that insane? I thought so, it blew my mind. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was a Hungarian noblewoman and a serial killer who lived from August of 1560 to August of 1614. She was born into one of the oldest and most powerful families in Transylvania, and she was well educated and ran various estates and bore many children. Oh, and this is all happening while she was also killing young women and bathing in their blood. Yeah, weird and gross and terrible. I know bathing in and drinking blood are not the same thing, but I think it's fair to admit that neither is necessarily normal behavior. Elizabeth is known for killing her servants and bathing in their blood as she believed it would keep her young. I guess no one told her about moisturizing and minding your own business. All accounts of Elizabeth remember her as a terrible, evil person. It is said that her number of victims most likely ranges somewhere from 175 to 200 but some people claim it might be as many as 600. It is no wonder she is referred to as Countess Dracula. In our number 9 spot today we have the Vampire of Dusseldorf. Peter Curtin, who is also known as the Vampire of Dusseldorf, was actually a German serial killer from the 1930s. This man committed some incredibly atrocious acts for which he was tried and convicted. He ended up being found guilty for the killing of 9 people, as well as attempting to take the lives of 7 more. This guilty verdict led to him being sent to beheading, which took place in 1931 when Peter was 48 years old. How he got nicknamed as the Vampire of Dusseldorf was because he admitted to having drunk the blood of at least one of his victims, if not more. How terrible, disgusting, and absolutely terrifying, like everything on this list today. In our number 8 spot today, we have Vlad the Impaler. I've talked about Vlad before, in fact I did a whole video on him, so if you haven't seen that one, make sure you check it out. But if you don't know who he was, he was the ruler of Wallachia three times between 1448 until his death in 1476. He is often regarded as one of the most important rulers in Wallachian history, and to many he is a hero. And this is not to disregard that, but you don't get a nickname like the Impaler by being a passive, peaceful guy. Vlad was known for his brutality and his love of impaling people, but it is also said that Dracula was modeled after him. This is because it is rumored that Vlad liked to dip his bread in the blood of his enemies before eating it. I prefer a little olive oil and balsamic vinegar with mine, but hey, to each his own, I guess. So although it isn't said that he was running around biting people's necks, I think the whole consumption of blood thing is enough to classify someone as having some vampiric tendencies. 
In our number 7 spot today we have Mercy Brown. This one is a little different than some of the others on this list today, and it's a bit dark, but it's an important part of our history so I feel I need to include it. Mercy Brown is said to be one of the most famous vampires in history. She lived in Exeter, Rhode Island in the late 1800s, and during this time, similar to the idea of the Salem Witch Trials, there were worries throughout the New England region about vampirism and the evil disease. It was happening often that bodies of those who had passed would be searched for what the townspeople considered signs or symptoms of the disease. Mercy and many members of her immediate family all passed around the same time, which sounds absolutely horrible for the family. To make matters worse, especially for the members of the family who were still living, other people in the town began to spread rumors about how all of these deaths were due to a vampire living amongst them. Mercy passed during the winter time and she was buried in an above ground vault which helped to preserve her body for a lot longer than a normal burial would. Do you see where I'm going? When her body was later exhumed to investigate these rumblings of vampirism, it was determined that this miraculous preservation of her body was because she of course was a vampire and it obviously had nothing to do with, I don't know, science. So of course, without being able to defend herself, she was accused and then the townspeople cut out her heart and burned it. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. So no, Mercy Brown was not a vampire. She was merely a victim of mass psychosis. In our number 6 spot today we have the Alnwick Castle Vampire. The story of this vampire is so old that it actually comes from a time before the word vampire even existed. This story was chronicled by a man called William of Newburgh and he reported that a man came back from the dead after he had passed while spying on his wife who was being unfaithful to him. When the man was spying he was on the roof which he ended up falling off of. He then returned to life as a walking, rotting corpse and began spreading plague to all of those still living. Apparently from here, a priest gathered a group of parishioners and together they all went and found the grave of the man. From there they stabbed the corpse and it is said that warm blood ran from his body which is how they confirmed their suspicions of him being a vampire or whatever the word for vampire was back then. They then burned the body and it is said that the attacks stopped. I wasn't there for this event, obviously. So I'm not exactly sure what really happened or how these stories came to be, but I think the people of the time may have exaggerated just a touch. Or a lot. In our number 5 spot today we have the Vampire of Croglin Grange. This event took place in the 1800s when the Cranwell family moved to Croglin Range in Cumbria. One evening Lady Cranwell noticed some strange lights in the garden below her bedroom but didn't think much of it. Later she saw those same lights but only this time they were closer to her window. When she went to investigate she realized that they were not lights but instead were eyes. She was absolutely terrified as anyone would be and to make matters worse whatever this creature was began removing her window panes before reaching in a rotten hand and opening the latch. Luckily her brothers heard her screams and came to help, but just as they entered the room they saw a cat-like figure escaping out into the darkness and Lady Cranwell was left with a wound to her neck. After this the brothers decided to slay the creature and set up a trap. They had their sister pretend to sleep in the same room and when the vampire tried to come in through the window again, the brothers jumped out armed with pistols and they shot at it. The vampire screamed and ran off into the night. The next day the brothers and a group of angry townspeople that they had assembled went out hunting for the vampire and they began searching the graveyard which is where they found an open crypt. Inside of it they found gnawed bones and a coffin that contained a corpse with what appeared to be a recent bullet wound. This was enough to convince the group that they had found the creature they were looking for and they went on to burn the body. In our number 4 spot today we have Vincenzo Verzeni. Vincenzo lived from 1849 to 1918 and he was a serial killer who had the nickname the Vampire of Bergamo. The first of his victims was found in 1870 and when authorities examined the body they found bite marks on the neck as well as certain parts of the body missing. The next of his victims he didn't end up taking the life of but he did try to bite their necks. In 1872 there was the next body of one of his victims that was found and it had all of the strange and disturbing signs that the previous one had. After Vincenzo was arrested he confessed to his crimes with the added details that he also chose to drink the blood of his victims before leaving their bodies. Somehow Vincenzo managed to escape the death penalty after a vote of sympathy from only one juror and he instead was sentenced to life in an asylum. In our number 3 spot today we have Neville Heath. Neville was a man who lived in the mid 1900s and he had a criminal history of committing fraud but no one really knew what dark sinister crimes he was really hiding. In 1946 in London he began committing 
committing identity fraud when he started posing as a lieutenant colonel. Under this guise, but using his real name at the hotel he checked into, he ended up taking the lives of two women, and with all of the other horrible things he did, he also drank their blood. It doesn't appear as if this was the motive for the killings, but rather just a terrible, horrible addition to it. Thankfully, Neville was caught by the authorities and ended up receiving capital punishment for his horrific doings. In our number two spot today, we have Arnold Pale. Arnold was a man who passed away in 1726, but before he passed, he began claiming that he had been bit by a vampire. He said that this bite had left him feeling cursed, and after his passing, people in the village he lived in also started passing away. Instead of thinking maybe some sort of disease was spreading, they remembered that Peter had said that he'd been attacked by a vampire, so they immediately believed that this must be the source of all of these strange deaths. When they dug up the body of Arnold, they had all the proof they needed to believe that he was really a vampire. It is said that his hair and nails were longer than when he had been buried, and that he had blood in his mouth, so naturally he needed to be burned. Four years after they exhumed his body and burned it, 17 more deaths in the village occurred, and it began to be blamed on the victims of Arnold. This guy just ended up taking the fall for a lot of stuff that happened in this village. In our number one spot today, we have Peter Pelagajewicz. When someone looks up real vampires in history, Peter's name is one of the first to pop up. Who is Peter? Well, he was a Serbian man who died in 1725, but he was thought by those who lived in his village to be a vampire. Shortly after his death, people in the town began to claim that they were being visited by Peter at night, which, like, of course, can't happen because he died, right? To make these reported sightings stranger, many of those who claimed to see Peter also ended up being found dead shortly after these sightings. Even Peter's own son apparently died from massive blood loss just days after he said he had seen his dad. This led to a case of mass vampire hysteria in the town where all the residents began to demand that Peter is a vampire who needed to have his body exhumed and burned. They did this, and it is said that his body had all the markings of a real vampire but who knows what that even means. They ended up burning his body, and it is said that after this was done, all of the sightings of Peter stopped. If you enjoyed this video about disturbing discoveries from the past, then you have to check out this video next. It's about upcoming natural disasters that were predicted a long time ago. Click the video now to prepare yourself.